with them in that 18 minute guided reading lesson. Lori, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Can I get visualize you to visualize in the story. So I got to have a, I always need visual aids. So I'm going to do that with my PowerPoint in just a minute. Yeah, it's funny. I, you know the whole research about the difference between skills and strategies? When you visualize automatically, it's a skill. It's not a strategy. When it just, you just get the pictures in your head. For me, I have to use it as a strategy. I have to actually stop and go, click, take a picture. And I was doing that. Actually, I was reading Girl with a Pearl Earring for my book club. And uh, I fell asleep, a line on the couch. My husband came by and he said, that visualizing really takes a lot out of you, doesn't it? So <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I, I tend to be a learner who needs visual aids, and so I have brought a few along uh, to talk today about my newest book, Guiding Readers, Making the Most of the 18-Minute Guided Reading Lesson. Now, Ron Benson said, what if it's 17 and a half? And I'm saying, hey, forget it, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm kidding, actually. You know, 18 minutes is really just a convenience more than anything else. I know it's gotten some allure. Uh, 18 minutes is about the length of um, a sitcom. We know about the TED Talks are 18 minutes long. I also read that uh, in the Bachelor Guy blog that 18 minutes is the average length of time an American has takes to have sex. <laughs> but Kat suggested I not put that one in the book. So this is just for our... our uh, <laughs> <laughs> 18 minutes. <laughs> I'm not hearing some of these little asides, and it's probably a good thing. Uh, 18 minutes is really just a scheduling convenience because generally I would allow, I prefer to allow a tw 20 minute block for a small group reading instruction. So I set the timer for 18 minutes, and then we have two minutes to make the transition to the next thing. So that's how 18 minutes arose. Um, as they say in the TED Talks, it's long enough to accomplish something, to get a point across, but short enough that you don't lose um, the attention of others, not to mention the kids who are working independently. So it turned out to be a convenient time. But the point of it is, is that it if we can't let our, our small group reading instruction lessons go on and on and on, for one thing, we've got 20 other kids who are, you know, need to be learning as well, that we need to control the time and make our guided reading more purposeful and intentional. When I wrote Guided Reading Basics in 2003, many of us, I, I will speak for my district in Regina, um, we're, it, we were re making a new transition. Most of us had gone to almost all whole class instruction. So going back to small group instruction was a big transition. And most of us were more concerned with what are the other kids doing? How do we get the other 20? In fact, I'm embarrassed to say that I have said many times to many people, anybody can work with four kids or six kids. It's the other 20 that I'm worried about. And, and now I'm thinking, I'm not sure we're making the most of those 18 minutes with that group of four or six kids. So guiding readers is more about the routines that we can use when we actually have the, that group of children in front of us for those precious few minutes. What are some things we can do to extend that and enrich their experience? Now, I, I was interviewed actually in the summer by a, a young, I'm assuming young, teacher who's a blogger, and she was doing this book study. And she said, but guided reading's getting a bad name out there by a lot of people. What, what, how do you respond to that? And I said, well, <laughs> after I had a little cry, <laughs> I said, um, that I hope it's not a lot, I hope it's just a few, but I think that we've kind of boxed ourselves into guided reading being certain things and not other things. And I'm thinking even the stuff that Bob did with us today could be that he had us using strategies, he had us visualizing, he had us doing partner talk, engaging with the text. Those are all things that could be part of a guided reading lesson, absolutely. So I think when we look at this, our traditional definition of guided reading, I'm still sticking to grouping kids uh, with similar needs. But maybe if I say instead of similar levels of development, probably now the way we think of guided reading is more children with similar instructional needs. Um, and I, but I'm still going to find those books that they can read because mostly I want my kids to be navigating, negotiating text. Um, 
what are some things, what are some pieces of, of guided reading instruction that uh, um, are different for me? Well, just briefly, I'm keeping the independent thing simple. I have spent way too much of my time creating activities that take me more time to prepare than they take the kids to do. And when we were using all our precious prep time creating independent learning activities, often we didn't have time for the really important work, the teaching. I don't know about you, but I was often winging it in the guided reading lesson. I'd go grab a book at five to nine and you know, sit with the group. Now I'm saying I want my kids to be involved, to be engaged, to, to look after themselves in independent learning. And I, I don't have much to say. I think the, the Daily Five sisters have said it, you know, said it better than anyone with their steps to muscle memory, how we teach kids to read independently. Even grades threes and fours and fives and beyond, we sometimes have to go through and model for them and get them to practice and build stamina because I want them to be reading. Isn't the whole idea of the independent part to practice what we did with, with support? So I've given myself permission to assign a must-do after small group instruction, that my kids will always have a task that requires them to practice the strategy further or that requires them to um, use the strategy with an, uh, another text or maybe just extends and enriches their experience with the text that they've read. So in independent learning, you're reading, you're writing, or you're doing the must-do, that the assigned task that follows up the small group. Um, the other thing, too, is I'm a little bit more relaxed about leveled books. Leveled books are a convenience, but they only tell us what the book brings to the task. I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm, in my mind, I'm still thinking that 95% support, 5% um, challenge to make them do some reading work. But more, I love the metaphor of what we want the books to do is have our kids standing on their tiptoes. You know, you can stand, you can do most of it on your own, but every now and then you need a little support or a scaffold. And if we start thinking about text in terms of just a little bit hard, that means sometimes we're going to give more support to a group of students or, or and sometimes it'll be easier. But it also opens the door to using a lot more different kinds of text in our small group reading instruction. That we don't need to be limited to leveled text. Um, there are all kinds of, maybe the, we're using magazine articles. Maybe we're using um, websites. One of my favorite things to use for guided reading Brochures, travel brochures. When I walked into the hotel by the lobby, there's a whole rack of travel brochures from Toronto. As you're slipping out the door, just kind of flip through. <laughs> Pick up, you know, if you find one that has nice, big, lots of color, lots of different fonts, lots of uh, uh, maybe a map or a chart or a table, just grab six <laughs> on your way out the door. Because, you know, this whole idea of functional text, I think the text we read the most is the one that we teach the least. How often do we teach the kids how to read a menu or a map or um, a chart or a TV schedule or directions for how to play a game? So if we just, you know, maybe back off a little bit from our 95% challenge, 95% uh, five, support, 5% challenge, and think about tech, making sure that texts are just a little bit hard, but the kids can read most on their own. It opens the door to using all kinds of texts for small group instruction. So those are a couple of places that I'm think that for me, um, small group guided reading has changed. The other is in the plan, and I actually put in your handout package um, a, a sample guided reading lesson plan, one that I have just used not too long ago. That's a little easier to read, I, I think, than this one up here. And I, th the, I think a key difference for me in the lesson, as I said earlier, I don't wing it anymore. I plan my lesson very carefully. I went to a workshop one time where the presenter said, this may very well be the most exquisite teaching you do because it's just in time, on the spot, meeting the needs of the children right there. So I want to make sure that that time is intentional and purposeful and planned. So some of the things that I've done with this is I start with a learning goal. 
And I try to have, we always start obviously with comprehension, that's got to be the foundation. But I always try to have a word level goal as well, because we're going to go back into that text a couple or three times. Then I'm going to choose a text that lends itself, that the children can read most of, that have them standing on their tiptoes, but lend themselves to whatever learning focus that I want to, fo to do. I, I think the book introduction is so important that I tend to still write it down. I plan it very carefully. But here's the thing that's often uh, that's different for me, is revisiting that same text usually three times, maybe even four, depending on how rich it is. That the first time we read it, it's just like first draft reading. You know, Kelly Gallagher has written a book called uh, Read Aside. I'm guessing Claudia probably has it. Um, you can order it. It's kind of interesting. He's a high school teacher. He says we should be treating reading more like writing with multiple drafts. Because the first read, the first draft, you're just getting the gist of it. Are you ever disappointed after you've had kids read something and you say, you start asking questions and they make shallow inferences and, and strange connections? It's because on the first draft, we don't really think deeply about it. We need to go back in and read it again to dive more deeply and, and analyze and, and close read the text. That's, and, and then generally I'll go back in a third time. And it's usually on the third time that I'll do some word study. We'll go in, look at vocabulary, look at structural analysis, various kinds of, um, or maybe fluency, or maybe we'll do some guided writing, which I've put into small group as well. So those are the three steps. And that's why I never, ever, ever would do a novel in guided reading. I would do a chapter of a novel or a small excerpt, just like our anthologies do. But can you imagine, if you're going to read every chunk of text three times, it would take us like three, six, I don't know how many months to read a novel. What a way, there's read aside, isn't it? What a way to ruin the reading of a piece of literature by reading every chapter three times and analyzing it. So I'm going to choose a chapter, but often reading one chapter of a text might give us the support we need for the kids to read much of the rest of the text on their own if we've chosen carefully. Not always. And one of the problems with novels is that the, the readability, the difficulty, varies tremendously from one section to the next. And then I, I mentioned, of course, the must-do. I'm going to plan my must-do as well. And, that is connected to the, whatever the learning goals were. That gives me a chance to assess. Um, it's going to give me, it maybe it's some strategy practice. There are some examples in the little uh, handbook, or the one pager that I gave. So the nice thing is I'm front loading. I don't have to go and plan every single day, plan for four groups or five groups. And by the way, I like four. Four works nicely for me. I'll do five if I have a very large class or really great diversity. But I think we have to decide what's manageable for us as well. And, and so anyway, so usually I don't have to be planning four, le four lessons every day because they're all going to be on different cycles. And, and uh, so the planning doesn't perhaps seem as onerous as it might. But we, by doing this, we're front loading. And then when my 18-minute timer goes, I'm done. Uh, that, I'll just have to continue the next day. So I'm not going to feel guilty if I take a fourth day or whatever. So that essentially is the, the structure of, of the lesson planning. And, and um, I have no problem with spending several days on the same text and revisiting. There's lots of research supporting the fact that it builds fluency and, and builds uh, comprehension. Now, I'd like to spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes and just share some random lesson routines. But I'm thinking that maybe right now I, this may be something that you're already doing. Maybe this kind of planning is new to you. You have a sample. Why don't you take two minutes just to talk at your table group? Anything here that resonates with you? Um, a couple of minutes to talk, and then we'll share some ideas. We can hear you. That one is just what you feel. OK, thanks. Just hold that thought. We'll have more time to talk in about 10 minutes. I just 
wanted to give you a chance to pull that together. And uh, I'm I can be heard at the back there, Mary, can't I? I? I thought I didn't really need them. I always say that anybody who can't speak in a room this size without a microphone hasn't done their share of playground supervision. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to make sure that I was this coming through clearly. Well, basically, the book is really all about you know this this organizational structure, but it's really all about a whole bunch of lesson routines that I've slotted into different stages of development. Our er emergent writer readers who are not yet decoding, our early readers who are starting to make letter sound connections, our developing readers who are reading the chapter books, and our fluent readers, which is kind of <laughs> Dr. Seuss to Shakespeare. But the, the, they're, I, I like to think of them as routines more than activities. I don't have time to be doing one-off activities that don't have any use or application for other things down the road. And I'll tell you, I don't have time to be st <laughs> standing at the photocopier doing what one of my little grade two boys used to call, them work <laughs> <laughs> So I'm always looking for things, you know, teaching kids routines, um, kinds of uh, procedures and, and exercises, activities that will have some application to more than one situation. However, um, just to, so I'm just to share a few ideas with you. I love have using reading manipulatives. And Dollarama is my favorite teacher's store. I can, I'm always finding something new that I can use for instruction. I'm a big fan of the free and the cheap. So I keep all kinds of reading manipulative, manipulatives around. For example, th these may even be on sale right now. I found giving the kids these witch fingers are really good to remind them about tracking. So we call them reading fingers, and, and they get their book and they get their reading finger because, of course, in kindergarten, beginning grade one, we want them tracking every word. The poor little gaffers, though, you know, what happens as soon as they master word, you know, word boundaries and, and voice print matching, then we say, okay, no more tracking. Now we want you to read in streams of words. So I'll often give them sliders, and that is a good tool for getting them to slide under each line of text to practice reading in phrases as opposed to reading word by word. So those are a, that would be a lesson that I might give um, for emergent readers about tracking, that I'll model the tracking. I, I guess the, uh, the piece I didn't mention earlier about uh, changes in my thinking, um, that sometimes I'm going to have to do a little bit of teaching as part of my guided reading. I used to think, you know, you have two ears, one mouth, don't do any talking. But sometimes I have to teach this little group something. Sometimes we're going to play a word game in small group instruction. For example, also dollar store. I'll often play. Uh, with a small group, we might play with a shower curtain board game. This one happens to be all high frequency words, you know, those words that keep popping up everywhere. And you can do all kinds of things with them. You can have it, um, they can toss a bean bag and they have to read the word. I will sometimes play musical words where I have them walk along and when the music stops, they have their little clipboard, they have to write down the word that they're standing on. When they've got two or three words on their clipboard, they have to go and read those wor their list of words to three other people. So they're writing the words, they're reading the words, you know, those high frequency words that you just have to know automatically. We might play a game like this in small group. The nice thing is that if we teach the these activities in small group, they can become the must-dos. Then the kids can be doing these things on their own as well. One thing I teach kids right from the start is that readers talk to their brains all the time. We talk to our brains about what we're reading. I find grade oneers really need this lesson re reinforced. Anybody else finding when our kids start to decode, they start reading silly stuff? You know, they sacrifice meaning for the sounds of the words. I remember my daughter doing that when she was six, and I said, Jennifer, does that make sense to you? And she looked at me in amazement and said, you mean it's all supposed to make sense? <laughs> so I'm always saying to, to my young readers, talk to your brain about, is what I'm reading make sense to me? I've got to, does what I'm reading make sense? Am I thinking about what it says? Does it sound right to me? Does it look right? So talk to your brain is something we'll practice in small group instruction where we'll read a section of text and say, okay, talk to your partner. Now talk to your brain. Um, 
that's what readers do all the time when they read, a wonderful self-monitoring tool. For older kids, I might give them a remote, I might teach them about remote control reading. I've often thought, I think, did I bring it along here? I didn't, doesn't matter. Um, I think one of the key differences between effective readers and ineffective readers is self-monitoring, wouldn't you say? Our kids, if you teach grade three or four, maybe even grade two, often our kids, our struggling readers, don't even know they don't get it. Or if they know they don't get it, they don't know when they stop getting it. And if they can find the, even if they can find the point of confusion, they don't know how to fix up the mix-up. And so I, this is one of these tools, that a metaphor for this is what readers do, that they, it's just like watching a, a movie on TV. You know, you hit the play button to get started. As a reader, we hit that play button in our head to get started. But every now and then, and often we'll practice every page, hitting the pause button in our brain and saying, now, does this, does this make sense? Am I getting this? Is it all right? And if you can answer yourself, yep, it's all fine, then hit that play button and keep on reading. But if you, if you say, I'm not sure, you better hit that stop button and either rewind a few pages, go back a few pages, or fast forward a few pages to see if you can fix up that mix up. So it's just really just a metaphor for teaching kids and practicing self-monitoring. I've seen some teachers make little bookmarks of these. I just give them clickers. I don't know about you, my family room's a graveyard of old, I think they reproduce, I don't even know where they're coming from. So I've just taken some of these old clickers and put uh, a, a little label on the back and I actually give the kids uh, a clicker to use as they're reading. It's nice for those kids, you have those kids who fidget when they read? You know, we call them boys. <laughs> I've often given my boys like a foosball or something just, be, you know, to, to fidget when they read, why not give them something they can push the buttons so that they're actually being metacognitive about what they do as readers. I like to use sticky notes a lot in small group reading. Um, another self-monitoring strategy I teach the kids is clicks and clunks. <coughs> You know, when everything's making sense, when we're all reading and it's all making sense, then we just click along. Everything's fine. But every now and then, you hit a clunk. Good readers hit clunks all the time. That's another thing our struggling readers don't know, is that good, everybody hits a clunk. But, and that's, it's not a bad thing if you hit a clunk, as long as you know you hit that clunk and that you can do something to fix up that mix-up. I love that language. Isn't that good language that says, it's not a mistake, it's not that you're a bad reader or you don't get it, you just hit a clunk. And so, when I, we're working on clicks and clunks in small group, I'll pick a text that I know the kids will have a couple of spots that they'll need to, uh, that, that will cause them problems, and I'll give them red and green stickies. And I'll say, when you hit a clunk in your reading today, tab it with a red flag. But if you figure out a strategy and can fix up your mix-up, take that red flag off and replace it with a green flag. And then after we've read that section of text, we'll go back and say, where did you hit a clunk? What did you do about it? What could you do about it the next time? So what we're doing is we're teaching the kids how to monitor their own reading and their own comprehension. Not uh, it's not for us to keep um, pointing out where the miscues or where the misunderstandings happen. So I'll give them clicks and clunks sometimes in their reading toolkits. By the way, because, uh, because that 18 minutes is so precious, I sure don't have time to be handing out sticky notes. So I've made these little toolkits, and these are, have been through the war. They're pretty, <laughs> you can see, really high tech. This is a file folder that I laminated and cut into about 10 centimeter strips. I put a little Sirlux coil at the top so they can stick a pencil through. And inside is going to hold whatever kinds of stickies they're going to need for that small group lesson. And that way I have in a tub, I've got their books and their, their toolkits so that I can hand this out and I'm not wasting precious minutes you know, distributing or, or hunting for, for stickies. So I'll do, we use stickies a lot for a whole variety of things. Um, one of my favorites is uh, vocabulary. 
Instead of me going through the book, which I do anyway, and find challenging vocabulary words, I want the kids to be able to find out, pick words that are difficult. Now, one of the lessons that I've learned is not to ask my kids to find three words that you had trouble with, because my struggling readers either don't know or won't admit they had trouble with any words. So now I say, highlight three words that you think somebody else might have trouble with. And they go in, and it's ne no problem ever to find that. And so we'll go in, and, and we'll look at the words the students highlighted and say, what is that word? What makes that word tricky? How are you going to remember that word the next time that you encounter it? So we build our strategies for word solving out of the words that the children have identified as, as uh, challenging. It was always my great sorrow that I couldn't find highlighting tape at Dollarama that you had to pay big money for this at a teacher's store until somebody brought me, found these little things at some, you know, I'm saying Dollarama as a generic for, you know, inexpensive kind of stores, but these are kind of translucent. I won't put, but so you can see through them as well. So I'm always on the lookout for tools that I'll be able to use. Now let's say we did some work, I might say as a must do, we've already read this passage today, so your must do for um, this lesson to prepare for next week is to highlight, go back in and skim three, and highlight three words that you think someone might have difficulty with. Then my next small group lesson we're going to use for talking about those words, and then I might have them do something if there's some vocabulary I want them to remember. I might have them make a, I call it a vocabulary square. You might know it as a Freyer chart, F-R-A-Y-E-R. -E They've sort of been around for a long time. And basically, in the first, we, we put the word in the middle. In the first box, we talk about, we take the sentence, the context from the reading. In the second, we give a definition. In the third, a visual cue. And in the fourth, a personal connection. And I just, whenever I can use a foldable instead of a, instead of a, you know, photocopied sheet, I will do that. We just make these out of paper from the recycling bin. Fold the, fold a piece of paper any size. Take home those little extra notepads. That's what we do, isn't it? Yeah. So we, anyway, fold it in four and take the bottom corner, the one that has two folds, and fold up a triangle. And when you open it out. You've got your chart, four squares and a diamond in the middle to write the words. So, you know, just those kind of simple little things so that I don't have to be responsible for making sure that I've prepared the sheet. I can just say, you must do today. You need to take two um, pieces of paper out of the recycling bin and, and choose two of the words that we worked on and make a vocabulary chart for them. Well, I know it's almost recess. <laughs> I know, I know, you're, most, most of you are doing the nutrition break thing, uh-huh. But I still wonder, like, how do you know when to go to the bathroom if you don't have bells? It's, we'll, we'll just have to monitor. Uh, it is just about time. Our recess was at 10.30, so I don't know. I'm a bit like Pavlov's dog, I guess. It's, instead of salivating the sound of a bell, I have this incredible urge to make a phone call and go to the bathroom. Um, so let me just share one last thing, and that is fluency. What we want our kids to do is read in phrases, pay attention to punctuation, um, look at uh, uh, expression. I call that lesson talk like the talker so that you use appropriate expression when you're reading as well. I do a lesson with, that we call robot reading and opera reading where we read a t passage like robots and then we read it very exaggerated and then we come back in the middle to talk about natural uh, uh, phrasing. This, I had a group of students. This, Turn, it happened quite serendipitously, really. I had a group of students who were stopping at the end of lines instead of reading on. Is that my minister at church actually does that too? And I just want to take them aside for a few minutes. But. <laughs> anyway, so what I did with the kids is I put up a passage and I said, let's read it together. Let's pretend there's no punctuation. That the whole, the, the whole, uh, we pause at the end of each line and we go through the whole line without stopping. And I even put a little slash. Can you read this text from where you are? All right. Would you read it with me? Ready? Sarah thought fast when I turned on the computer smoke, came out so I called the fire, 
department they put out the fire, but the computer is a big mess, and my dad is kind of mad. Well, even the kids know you don't say I ca um, came out, so I called the fire. Why would you call a fire? I turned on the computer smoke. It, even the kids can hear when they exaggerate the reading. So we talk about the way that punctuation marks are really the traffic signals of reading. They tell us when to slow down and when to stop and when to make our voice go up and when to make our voice excited. So one of the things that I do with the kids is we do noisy punctuation. You know, do you remember Victor Borges' sketchy phonetic punctuation? Same deal. So I'll say, okay, this time we're going to read it again, but this time when you come to a period, sound effect and action. When you come to um, exclamation, it's just like a shh, a comma, nert, and that's good enough for that. What's the period again? Oh, you got to do the action, you know, audio, auditory, visual, kinesthetic. Um, at, uh, comma, nerd, exclamation, shh. I, I'm not patronizing you. I'm just trying to keep you awake for another two minutes. So, <laughs> all right, let's try it this time. If there's no punctuation at the end, we've just got to go right on through. But if there is, then we have to do the appropriate gesture and sound, okay? Sarah thought fast. When I turned on the computer, nerd, smoke came out. I call, so I called the fire department, shh, they put out the fire, but the computer is a big mess, and my dad is kind of mad. There you go. So I, the amazing thing that I found with this, and we'll do this often, just as practice, reading in phrases and reading with fluency, the amazing thing to me is the, the spin-off this has had in their writing. Do you have any of those kids who, you know, the capital is here at the top of the page and the period's at the end of the page and it's all one long sentence? And I find with kids, they often know. They have a sense of where the sentence is. They just don't know where to put the punctuation. So I'll tell the kids, go read your writing to the wall. <laughs> you know, if you sit uh, knees against the wall, you can get a little echo back. That's why I say, read your writing to the wall. And when you come to a place that you listen to when your, your voice pauses, because probably when your voice pauses is a time to put in a and maybe a and so. Anyway, I, f I found that's a good editing tool as well for uh, sentences, because they listen to, for run-on sentence, they listen to the, uh, the pause points. Well, that is a random collection of some of the routines that are, are in uh, Guiding Readers. But I guess the point I want to make is that we've got to ha always have those routines in place. They've got to be linked to goals. What is it I want my students to learn from, at, um, from this task? And um, they've got to be something that, that is at their developmental level. And they've got to be short. So let me just leave you with one. Bob had a nice quote from his book. I have one from Mosaic of Thought. But I think this really says what we try to do with guided reading, with perhaps all our literacy instruction. If reading is about mind journeys, then teaching reading is about outfitting the travelers, modeling how to use the map, <coughs> demonstrating the key in the legend, and supporting the travelers as they lose their way and take circuitous routes till ultimately it's the child and the map together, and they're off on their own. And I think that is our ultimate goal. Thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy your break.